All right, if you've got your uh, Bible with you, go with me to the book of Malachi. We're going to be finishing off uh, chapter 2 this morning, which we, uh, in a section that we began last week. So Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and we are going to be working through uh, verses uh, 13 to 16 of a larger section that we, as I said, began looking at last week. In his preaching commentary on the Minor Prophets, James Montgomery Boyce, who is a, an older pastor uh, who had a radio program, has had several books that he published, but in this uh, preaching commentary, he mentions an old book about marriage called For Better, Not For Worse. And in this uh, book, Marriage For Better, Not For Worse, it was, it was published in the year 1934, so it's an older book about marriage. And it was written by uh, a man by the name of Walter Meyer, who was a Lutheran pastor. He had a radio program, and he wrote this book. And in this book, he made some predictions about the state of marriage in the United States back in 1934 that seemed far-fetched at the time. In fact, they seemed so far-fetched to people that he actually had to defend himself for the predictions that he made. But here are a couple of those predictions. Meyer was looking at the divorce rate in the country. And in that book, in 1934, he suggested that by 1950, one out of every four marriages was going to end in divorce. And he further predicted that by the year 1990, one out of every two marriages would end in divorce. Now again, people accused him of sensationalism and exaggerating. And he wasn't completely right. He missed his first mark by a decade. In 1950, it was not one out of every four couples that divorced. It was not until 1960 that that happened. By 1972, one out of every three marriages ended in divorce. And then by 1977, 13 years ahead of his prediction, Almost one out of every two marriages in the United States ended in divorce. Now, the divorce rate has actually improved somewhat since the 70s. Exact divorce statistics are difficult to come by, but those who study these things suggest that the divorce rate is somewhere around 42 to 45 percent, which means that for every wedding you attend, One of those, statistically speaking, is going to end with divorce papers being filed, custody battles being worked out, and assets being distributed. Now, contrary to some of the people who raise the red flags to say that the divorce rate is the same among evangelical Christians as it is among the world, that is not necessarily true. Among people who are committed Christians, the divorce rate is much lower. However, the statistics and the trends, even among Christians, remains significant. Divorce is simply a part of our lives. It is a normal part of our lives. And today we're going to be talking about divorce as we continue studying the passage of Scripture that we began studying last week. But let me say this before we begin. This is an emotional topic. And it is a difficult topic. And I want you to know that I understand that. There are numerous people within our church who have experienced divorce, people who are even experiencing it now. The subject of divorce is incredibly painful to talk about because of what it is. And there are people here in our church who are all over the spectrum in the circumstances of divorce. There are people who have mutually parted ways. There are people who have been cheated on, people who have been abused, people who have been left. We want to know that we have compassion towards you. The purpose of the message today is not to talk about your divorce in particular and the circumstances of it. 
The purpose of the message today is we just preach through books of the Bible, we encounter difficult and thorny subjects, and then we talk about what the Bible has to say about those difficult and thorny subjects. And so we want to see what the Bible has to say about divorce, and particularly what the book of Malachi has to say about it. So if you've been with us for most of this series, you'll know that the book of Malachi, in the book of Malachi, God makes six accusations against his people, six main accusations against his people. And last week, we began studying the third of those six accusations, and that accusation is this, you disregard my covenants. You disregard my covenants. All throughout this passage, Malachi is telling them that they have been faithless. And I said last week, if you're the kind of person that underlines or highlights things in your Bible, you'll see that the word faithless appears, particularly in the English Standard Version, which I'm preaching from, the word faithless appears no less than five times in these short verses. So how were they being faithless to the covenants? How were they disregarding the covenants that God had given them? Well, first, as we saw last week, they were disregarding God's covenants by the vows that they were making. They were disregarding God's covenants by the vows that they were making. We saw in verses 10 to 12 that they were marrying people from the surrounding nations And the problem with that was not that they were marrying people from the surrounding nations because Israelite people were somehow a better race than the other people around them. They were marrying with the other nations, and that was a problem because of the religious significance of that. They were marrying people who worshipped other gods. And we saw there are examples throughout Scripture of what happens when you when we see people marry other, uh, other people who worship other gods and it pulls them away from the one true God. Not only does it pull them away from the one true God, but it was a breaking of the covenant of Moses that he had made with the people in the first place. So they disregarded God's covenants by the vows that they were making. But today, in the second half of this message, we want to see that the, the second way that they were disregarding God's covenants, a second way they were being faithless or unfaithful, and that was by the vows that they were breaking, by the vows that they were breaking. We can see that in verses 13 to 16. We're going to see that there are husbands, a whole group of husbands, who are divorcing their wives for no reason. That God has strong things to say about. So let's uh, begin our reading in Malachi chapter 2. Let's read verses 13 and 14 together. Here's what the Word of God says. And this second thing you do, God says to them, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning because He no longer regards the offerings or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does He not? The answer is this, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Malachi is returning in these verses that we've just read to a theme that you have probably noticed over and over again throughout the verses that we've read as we've made it through the first two chapters of Malachi. And that theme is the subject of the offerings that God is not going to accept. God is telling me, I am not going to accept your offerings. You can weep, you can cry a river of tears, you can do whatever emotional displays that you want, but I am not going to accept the offering from your hand while you conduct yourselves in this way, while you deliberately disobey me. Now, what God is not saying here is that for him to accept their offerings, they had to be perfect and sinless, of course, because what, are the, what is part of the reason the offerings are being offered for in the first place? The offerings are being offered to deal with sin. So God isn't expecting, expecting perfection from them. What God is telling them is that it is the essence of hypocrisy to disregard my covenants and then bring an offering to me as if I'm going to look the other way while you do whatever you want 
and then go through the motions of worship. And as he says that to them, we see the pushback that, God, that, they, that the people give him with the words, but you say, uh, as, they, as they argue with what uh, God is accusing them of in verse, the, verse 14. He says, but you say, why does he not? They're feigning ignorance here. Why, why would God not accept our offerings? I mean, we're, we're trying to do it the right way, aren't we? We're, we're crying, we're emotional about this. God gives his answer. He is not accepting the offerings from their hands because of the vows that they're breaking. And I said last week that God speaks to them like a faithful best man in their wedding. God says, comes back to them and says, I am a witness of the vows that you made to your wives. And now he is coming to them like a faithful best man who witnessed the vows that they had made and calling them to be faithful to those vows. There are three ways that God refers to the relationship here in these verses that we've been looking at. One of the ways is that God says you are divorcing the wife of your youth. And when God says you're divorcing the wife of your youth, he's referring to the longevity of their relationship. We have to remember that their culture was a culture that was far different from ours. They lived, believe it or not, in a time when there was no such thing as Match.com or Tinder or eHarmony or OkCupid. They lived in a time where they were not looking for fairy tale stories about a boy meeting a girl, falling in love, uh, getting married in front of a castle, and living happily ever after. They had a different understanding of marriage and different way of going about it back then. Marriages at that point were arranged. Now, to us and to our modern ears, that sounds completely awful, but that was totally normal to them. They wouldn't have they would they would have felt the same way about about uh, falling in love romantically with somebody as we probably feel about the idea of marriages being arranged. But oftentimes, these marriages were arranged. When, the, when the, the couple, by the parents, when the couple were still children, obviously they weren't married at that point, they were arranged at that point. But the point that Malachi is bringing to their attention, he's talking about the longevity of the relationship that was being broken. He's talking about something that was arranged between two families many years ago that's being ruined. God also says that she is your companion. In verse 14, and by referring to her as his companion, God is drawing attention to the equality of the relationship. Malachi holds a high view of marriage, where culturally speaking, there would not have been a high view of marriage. That word companion is used elsewhere throughout the Hebrew Bible to refer to somebody who is a friend or a partner. And Malachi is saying, your wife is your valuable companion, your friend, your partner in the relationship who cannot be and should not be simply tossed aside because you are no longer interested in her. And thirdly, he refers to the fact that she is your wife by covenant. And this is referring to the integrity of the relationship. Marriage vows are not to be made lightly. When a couple stands at the altar, they are to do so with the understanding that barring special circumstances, they are making a decision that will, God willing, last a lifetime. Now again, there are many people in our church who are, who are in broken marriages through no fault of their own. They made that promise and meant it. So t- sometimes we find ourselves at the mercy of other people's sinful choices. But God comes to these unfaithful husbands and tells them that they're destroying the integrity of the marriage covenant. And so he doesn't ma- says, it doesn't matter how much you flood my altar with tears, I am not going to accept this offering from your hands 
while you are unfaithful to your wives. Now let's move on and look at verses 15 and 16. But before we read them together, I just want to say that these verses are difficult to translate from Hebrew to English. And so we've got people who are reading different translations of the Hebrew in English. I am preaching and reading from the English Standard Version, which is an English translation of the, of the, uh, of the Bible. Some of you may be holding other translations. And as we read these verses, if you're holding a different translation, you're going to notice some differences. We'll talk about some of those differences, but I just want to say as you hear those differences, you need to understand that the differences in translation do not impact the the outcome of the meaning, what's being communicated in any significant way. So let's read those verses together and then we'll make some remarks about them. Here's what verses 15 and 16 says. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. To the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Now, we'll see here in verse 15 that God gives to people through the prophet Malachi two reasons why they must be faithful to their marriage covenant. And here's the first one. The first reason they ought to be faithful to their marriage covenant is because it is God himself who has made them one. It's God himself who has made them one. And here's where we're going to encounter our first difference in translations. There are two different ways you could understand the word spirit in these texts that are reflected in the translations that you have. There are some people who see it as as spirit should be capitalized. The word spirit here would be referring to the Holy Spirit. And if the intent is to refer to the Holy Spirit, then what Malachi is communicating is that when a couple comes together and is made one, they have a unity of the Spirit. They have unity of the Holy Spirit in God in that union. However, the Hebrew text does not tell us whether this is referring to the Holy Spirit or whether it's talking about the immaterial part of us. He talks about my, my spirit or my soul. And so there are some who see this not as a reference to the Holy Spirit, but as to the immaterial part of me. And in that case, what the Bible would be saying is that, is that we are one with our, our spouse and with the Lord, body and spirit. In other words, all of you, material part of you or immaterial part of you, and a material part of you, one with each other and one with the Lord. Either one of those things could be uh, the way the Hebrew text is going there, which is why you see the differences in translation. Now, my intent today is not to solve and walk through all of the nitty-gritty of the grammar there because I believe the point remains the same regardless of the translation. When a couple makes marriage vows... The Bible is telling us that they are not entering into a temporary sort of ad hoc relationship that can exist while both parties are getting what they want and then can be dissolved at any time if one or more are not. We have all sorts of relationships in life that are like that, right? We sign contracts in businesses where we both agree to perform services. You have to sign things sometimes for the place that you work. There are other sorts of of things that we join. We have contractual obligations to that we can keep those contractual obligations. And when those obligations end or when we decide that we want to end those obligations, we are free to do so. But marriage is not one of those things. And what Malachi is telling the people is they did not enter enter into some kind of temporary agreement. Marriage is a sacred covenant 
made before God himself. The Bible tells us that God is involved in our marriages in a way that he is not involved in our other contracts that we make for all kinds of varieties of reason in life. Because the Bible tells us that when a couple makes marriage vows before God, God makes them one. There's something different and special going on there. And this is the way it has been from the very beginning with the first marriage. The Bible shapes our understanding of marriage at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. The Bible says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become, remember what it is, one flesh. Malachi is reflecting his understanding of Genesis here. That when a person enters into a marriage, when a couple enters into a marriage covenant with each other, they are being made one flesh. God is creating a one flesh union where the two become one before God. And that is the first reason why God calls upon them not to break their marriage vows. What sometimes uh, you hear read at, at wedding ceremonies, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Okay, that's a reflection of the understanding that when we make marriage vows, God is doing something to make two one. But there's a second reason why they should not be faithless to the wives of their youth. And it's because the Bible says God is seeking godly offspring from as a product of that marriage. Now, before we talk about that for a few moments, let me, sit, let me just say what that does not mean. It does not mean that godly parents guarantee godly offspring. Okay, so that's an important thing to note. God's will of desire in this section is that parents stay together, unions be upheld, so that godly offspring can be produced, but that is not a guarantee that godly offspring will be produced produced. It secondly does not mean that godly offspring cannot come from a single parent home or for some sort of situation that is less than the biblical ideal. There are all kinds of people probably sitting here this morning and certainly in our church who have come from different kinds of situations where the parents weren't together or one was a Christian and one was not, or neither one was a Christian. There are all sorts of situations like that where they have come to Christ. God saves all kinds of people all the time. So it's not saying that godly parents can guarantee godly children or that godly children can't come from a single parent home, but it does point to one of the purposes of marriage, which is to produce godly offspring. God told Adam and Eve the first, in the first marriage that they were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That promise is repeated several more times throughout Genesis. Why does God want that? God wants parents to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth because they are filling the earth with people who bear His image. And God wants His image to be spread and multiplied throughout the earth so that thousands and thousands of image bearers reflect him and bring him glory. Further, God desires for us as Christian parents, as much as lies within us, to raise children who are working for the kingdom of God. Psalm 127 talks about the fact that uh, children are like arrows in the hands of a warrior, which means you're not raising children for you, You're raising children for the Lord. You're not raising your children. You are raising God's children. And so rather than trying to keep them close, what you are trying to do is prepare them to be strung up into a bow like a warrior would do and shoot them out to do damage for the kingdom of God. Damage in a good way. That's the the goal of Christian parenting. And these men in particular who were dissolving these marriages made that 
vision more difficult to achieve by being unfaithful to their wives. The section is going to wrap up in verse 16 with a a statement of what God thinks about those who divorce their wives without cause. And here's our our second main interpretive translational difference that you're going to see in our English translations. There are some translations who are going to see that, that, that talk about God hating divorce. In fact, it It puts those words in the mouth of God. God says, I hate divorce. The New American Standard uh, translation does that, and the older version of the New International Version, the 1984 version, not to get nerdy, um, but the 1984 version translates it that way as well. God is saying, I hate divorce. But the Hebrew there is difficult, and translators recognize that it could also be translated the way it is in our text, where uh, it says in uh, verse 16, for the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord of God of Israel, covers his garment with violence. And the way that translation is taking it is not God saying he hates di- divorce, but th- that uh, the man is saying he hates his wife. Now that word, does not love, can also be translated throughout the Hebrew Bible as hate. In fact, do you remember at the beginning of uh, Malachi when it says, Jacob I love, but Esau I have hated. That's the same Hebrew word that's being used there at the beginning in the opening verses as being used here. Regardless of what's being said, whether God is saying, I'm the one who hates divorce, and that does violence and harm, or whether a person, a, a man who Uh, uh, divorces his wife, is hating her and doing harm to her, regardless of how you take that, God is obviously telling us in the scriptures here that that he does not take this lightly. A person who for no reason severs that marital relationship with his wife as a person whom the Bible says covers his garments with violence. If there is a murder... And there are suspects, and one of those suspects happens to have blood on his clothes, that might give you a little bit of an indication that that suspect may have had something to do with the murder. We talk about the fact that the person has blood on their hands. And when we say a person has blood on their hands, what do we mean by that? We mean that a person is guilty. And that's the same kind of metaphor that's being used here in our text God, uh, through Malachi, is telling the people here, husbands that have abandoned their wives and divorced their wives, you have covered your garment with violence. You have blood on your hands. You are guilty, and I am holding you guilty for not keeping the covenant of the wife of your youth. These are some of the strongest statements in all of Scripture about how God feels about breaking the marriage covenant. Now, we need to ask a question before we move on. And it's this. Is this statement about God's hatred of divorce absolute? In other words, does God hate divorce in the sense that divorce is never permissible in any time or in any situation, according to the Old Testament? And according to the Old Testament, I think the answer to that has to be no. God hates divorce, but God often permits what he hates. Let that sink in for a minute. God often permits what he hates. There's a lot going on in the world right now that God is permitting that he hates. Let me give you an illustration from another another, illustration. sphere of of influence, Uh, we would say that we would hate for children to be separated from their parents. We would hate that. But there are situations, right, when it is necessary for the good of the children to separate them from their parents. That's a step that's being taken that we hate, but becomes necessary for one reason or another. Now, the people... Let me give you a couple of of instances of this from the Old Testament itself. Remember last week when I told you that there were uh, 
we, we talked about the fact that they were intermarrying people from other nations, and I talked about the fact that Ezra and Nehemiah both talk about this as a huge problem in Israel. Ezra even going so far as to giving a list of names of the people who are doing this. Well, one of the things that I didn't tell you last week from Ezra is that, is that the people make a pact, a covenant to obey God by divorcing these wives that they had taken from these other nations. Furthermore, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, there are laws given in this, these verses that specify when a divorce is permissible and in what circumstances remarriage is permissible. Verse 1 of Deuteronomy 24, you can look at that later, but verse 1 says that a certificate of divorce may be written by a husband if he has found some sort of indecency in his wife which the majority of Bible interpreters understand to be some sort of marital unfaithfulness. So while there were, in the Old Testament, circumstances where divorce was permissible, God is coming to the people here in this text and saying, these are not those kinds of instances. The Bible does not tell us why they were divorcing their wives. It simply tells, them, tells us that they were doing it and that God absolutely hated what they were doing. They were covering their garments with violence. And he tells them that if you are going to break your vows to your companion, your wife by covenant, the wife of your youth, you can flood, you could, you could cry enough to, to bury this altar in tears. I'm not going to accept sacrifices from your hands. So having understood that, let's take a, a couple moments then to consider some, some truths that we can take away from a passage of Scripture like this. And I want to just give two suggestions for you. We've got uh, the Lord's Supper coming up that we need to get to, but I want to make uh, two, take, give you two takeaways as quickly as I can this morning. First, let us consider the importance of being faithful to our marriage vows. Simple. But let's consider the importance of faithfulness to our marriage vows. If you're married, God is calling you as much as lies within you to be faithful to those vows. And we need reminders sometimes because the ending of relationships, these cataclysmic endings of relationships, don't just happen overnight. They happen over time. As I become frustrated with the person I'm with, I become increasingly annoyed with the person that I'm with. I start fantasizing about a life in which they don't exist. And those sorts of thoughts lead to small actions, and sometimes larger actions, that cause the end of relationships in ways that are not pleasing to God. So let us consider and recommit ourselves as couples about the importance of our marriage vows. How does divorce play into this in the New Testament? My personal belief, and there are differences in, in interpretation of what the Bible has to say about divorce. So you heard me put, there. I put an important word before the word belief. Did you hear what that word was? It was the word personal. My personal belief is that there are circumstances in which divorce is biblically allowable by the New Testament though not required. Choosing my words carefully here. There are circumstances, I believe, in which divorce is biblically allowable, though not required. One of those circumstances in this is in the case of marital unfaithfulness. Consider this incident from Matthew chapter 19. And Pharisees came up to him, that's to Jesus, and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? 
He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? There's our Genesis text. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Now, we don't have time to explore all the stuff that's going on here, but there were two schools of thought among the Jewish people regarding Deuteronomy chapter 24 that I mentioned earlier in the message. Talked about, talked about uh, uh, finding something indecent in his wife, which, was, uh, which most people understand to be some sort of marital unfaithfulness. But there was a, a school of thought that interpreted that much more broadly to basically be anything at all that I don't like about her. If I don't like the way she drives, or I don't like whatever it is that she does, If I find anything indecent there at all that's not to my liking, I've got a clear biblical warrant to get rid of her. And Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh. That's not how we're interpreting the Old Testament here. Jesus says that anyone who marries another and divorces his wife and marries another, except in the instance of sexual immorality, is committing adultery. Jesus Uh, There's another category in which divorce, divorce, I believe, in the New Testament is permissible. That's one that we've seen on numerous occasions from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15, but I'll read it to you again. It says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Remember what was going on there? We have a couple. One of them becomes a Christian. The other one does not. The, people are ask, the Christians are asking the questions, do I need to get out of this one flesh union with this person who's not a Christian? And the Apostle Paul says, absolutely not. If that person will consent to stay in the marriage with you and live with you, live out the rest of your days with them. But if that person leaves you and divorces you, you're called to peace, let them go ahead and depart and leave you. Of course, as painful as that would be. I would say that There is a a third category that's not explicit in Scripture, but that is a form of abandonment, and that is abuse. I'll just say to you now, if you are in an abusive relationship and we don't know, you will find help here. We will not look the other way. You will find help. There are certain circumstances where God permits what He would not want for us. But here's the main point that we ought to take away. Apart from those circumstances, our marriage vows are sacred. We have made those vows before God. God has made a one flesh union out of two people, and as Christians, we are simply not given the option to get rid of our spouses simply because we tire of them, simply because we have what we call now irreconcilable differences with them. That's not the way Christians behave. The Old Testament and the New Testament are in agreement about how important those vows are. But here's the second takeaway. I want us to secondly consider how faithful God is to his vows to us. One of the metaphors that the Bible uses over and over again about the relationship between God and his people is the relationship of a faithful husband and his bride. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5 says this, your maker is your husband. Your maker is your husband. Again and again, there is this picture in the Old Testament, particularly in the prophetic books, of God being this faithful husband and Israel, his people, being his unfaithful bride. And what God says in no unvarnished terms is a lot of times his people behave more like a whore than a wife. 
The Bible doesn't spare our sensibilities in talking about it. But what it does show us is that though God's people are continually unfaithful to Him, He is unfailingly faithful to them. Which means He is unfailingly faithful to you. You and I have cheated on God over and over again. And not once has God ever for a second been unfaithful to us. This metaphor is carried into the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What this picture is presenting to us is a a pure, spotless, clean bride. Not because of what she has done, but because of what God has done for her. What God has done for us. And Jesus has proved his faithfulness to us by going to the cross and paying to have us as his precious blood with the currency of his precious blood. Here's why that's such good news. Maybe you haven't been faithful to your wedding vows and have broken this marriage covenant, your marriage covenant with your spouse in ways that have ended in divorce or not. You can receive the great and precious promises of the gospel that in Christ all sins are washed clean. Maybe you're trapped in a difficult marriage. You're unloved, unappreciated, misunderstood. You need to know that Jesus gave himself up for you. And as long as Jesus is with you, you are not alone. Maybe you've been cheated on, abandoned, or abused. Jesus is someone who will never cheat on you, abandon you, or abuse you. And you can bring all of the hurt to him. Promises a peace that surpasses understanding. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you don't know Jesus this way at all. And If you wonder how in the world it is that we could come and gather week after week after week and sing the same songs and worship week after week after week and not get tired of it, it's because of this good news. It's because Jesus has been so faithful to us. We love him and we want to worship him. And you can have your sins forgiven and your cheating record wiped clean simply by repenting of your sins and putting your faith in Jesus. We're about to share elements in just a moment that celebrate this fact. So I'll give us instructions, but before I do, I want to pray as we th- and thank God for his faithfulness to us as represented in his shed blood and broken body. So let's pray together. Lord, this morning... We pray as we take these elements together that you would help us do so with joy, knowing what they represent. These elements that we take together recommend your, uh, represent your unfailing love to us. That we are not faithful to you in a thousand ways you remain constant and faithful to us because you cannot deny yourself. And so I pray that as we take these things together, that you would help us to believe and rejoice that the gospel is true. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.